Okay, um, so thank you for coming and uh, thank you to the organizing committee for inviting us out here today to talk about our research. Um, the outline of the talk is as follows. Um, so the talk breaks down into basically two components. We developed an algorithm based on canonical correlation analysis, which uses um, DNA methylation and copy number to infer gene regulatory networks. Um, and then we use the results from that analysis as a prior in the dynamic Bayesian network um, algorithm. So there's kind of two components here. Um, so as you know, DNA methylation and copy number alterations are among um, some of the many different regulatory mechanisms that affect gene expression. Um, it's not surprising that if, a, cop if um, a gene has a reduced copy number, is that better? Okay, that's louder. Um, so it's not surprising if a gene has a reduced copy number um, that that gene would be underexpressed and if it has um, if it's amplified, then it would tend to be overexpressed. Um, and so more recently, some studies have aimed at, um, these genome-wide studies have tried to uncover copy number drivers of gene expression, where the alteration has um, a widespread effect on many downstream targets. Um, so um, in the study, study I cited there, um, they actually use CCA. Um, with the penalization method. So typically they adopt um, methodologies from ElasticNet to try to find um, copy number drivers of gene expression. So um, these alterations that have widespread effects throughout the genome. Um, these studies um, don't have much to do with networks, but they typically um, can find cohorts of co-expressed or co-regulated genes um, and the associated biomarkers. Um, DNA methylation is also known to correlate with gene expression. The Varley et al. study that um, is cited here um, showed that the correlation was dependent on the CPG status as well as the genomic position of the methylation, but nonetheless, it's correlated. So these studies in combination um, suggest that DNA methylation and copy number alterations could be used to infer gene regulatory networks. Um, so there are a few studies out there that have used structural and epigenetic data sets to infer gene regulatory networks. Um, the Zhang et al. study used histone features um, and found that they're more correlated when there's a known relationship between the two genes. Um, so that goes along with co-expression. And they use this information as a prior in the dynamic Bayesian framework. Um, and then so DBNs, as you might know, um, identify relationships between genes based on conditional probabilities across time slices. So um, that always employs a time series data component. Um, and then the inference can be improved by incorporating biological knowledge as a prior. So there's a lot of papers out there on um, different informative priors that people have used in this framework. So the goal was to um, infer gene regulatory networks by integrating gene expression, copy number alterations, and DNA methylation data sets. So we implemented the canonical correlation-based algorithm um, to build biological priors using copy number and DNA methylation. So the results from that um, we analyzed, and then we used that as a prior in the dynamic Bayesian network approach um, to infer GRNs using the CCA-based priors. Okay, so I'll go over the algorithm now. Um, so CCA just relates one set of variables to another set of variables. So the idea here was um, to relate DNA methylation or copy number states of potential regulators to the gene expression states of potential targets. Um, so we compare this to just using expression for both the regulators and for the targets. So DNA methylation or copy number effects down, um, affects the expression of a regulator, which should have ex, um, downstream effects on the targets. So compared to just using expression data for the regulators and for the targets, um, we hope that this may establish directionality. So in a sense, it's sort of acting as a perturbation on the regulator. Um, so the scores uh, from the CCA algorithm are suitable to be used as a prior for the dynamic Bayesian network algorithm. Um, so the, the algorithm, the algorithm itself resamples a small portion of the total set of genes iteratively and applies CCA on the subset. 
Um, at each iteration of resampling, um, you're going to take the expression levels of a subset of genes that represent potential targets. So if you have, say, 25 genes, you might select five genes to say, okay, these are potentially targets, and then you'll use the expression levels for those genes. And then you'll take a different subset. You'll take the DNA methylation or copy number of a non-overlapping subset of genes, and those will represent your potential regulators. Um, so you'll have a different set of five that would be, um, you'd use DNA methylation or copy number for the, those five. Um, CCA was applied um, between the two subsets, and the top weighted regulators were selected and then scored in relation to the targets. So the scores take into account the weight of the regulator, the weight of the target, and the canonical correlation between um, the two subsets, and that's continuously updated during resampling. Okay, so I'll go over the results from that part. Um, so to, the, to be able to do this, we downloaded 175 breast cancer samples from the Cancer Genome Atlas. Um, that's the DNA methylation and gene expression and copy number alteration data sets that we used um, and the respective platforms. Um, we collected experimentally validated interactions in the TRED and HTRI databases. Um, so we have three networks that we use, the GTA, the BRCA, and FOXA1, and that's the number of genes and the number of interactions that were present. Um, so when I say GTA3 network as a point of clarification, um, there's 25 genes there. We just named it after each network, after kind of the major hub that's in it, but it's certainly not the only one that's interacting. Um, so when I say GTA3, I'm not referring to just the gene, I'm referring to a whole network. So um, just a clarification there. Um, so these are the ROC curves for using um, different data sets as a prior in the CCA algorithm. So panel A is the GTA3 network, and then B is the BRCA network, and C is the FOXA1 network. And so the red line is using DNA methylation as for potential regulators. Uh, the blue line is using copy number as potential regulators. The green is using expression data for both the regulators and the targets. Um, and then the targets are always expression data. So, um, And then the average is the average between um, the DNA methylation CCA results and the copy number CCA results. Um, so we see here that um, at least for our algorithm, that the DNA methylation and the copy number data sets are outperforming actually using expression data for the potential regulators. Um, in this one, we did um, just a simple correlation. So this is a co the correlation between the DNA methylation states of the regulators and the expression states of the targets. And so the score here would be um, the absolute value of the correlation is what we use as kind of the score here. Um, and then, so if you took the absolute value of the correlation, that would perform um, worse than what we did here. So our algorithm's more robust than if you were just to take a simple correlation between any of the two um, data types that you're using for regulators and targets. Um, I will also point out that actually DNA methylation performed a little bit better here too, so that might not be just specific to our algorithm, but um, I just wanted to point that out. Um, for this figure, this is all for the GTA3 network, although we show this for other, the other two networks as well. Um, it, the first panel is using DNA methylation as potential regulators. Panel B is um, copy number as potential regulators. And then GTA3 is a, uh, expression data as potential regulators. And so we compared the scores of the experimentally validated interactions to the non-experimentally validated interactions, which we'll assume are non-interactions. And so we found that when we used DNA methylation or copy number data sets that the scores, there was a more significant difference in the scores. Um, so, and then that was not the case for the expression data set. So, um, from this perspective, it also looks like the DNA methylation and the copy number data sets are more useful in our algorithm. Um, so now we'll go into the DBN part of it where we use the results from the CCA algorithm as a prior. 
Um, the methodology that we used was adopted from Worley and Hussemeyer 2007. Um, so the goal of the DBN algorithm is to find the most probable structure given the data, which is really the goal of any gene, inf uh, gene regulatory network inference algorithm. Uh, we used the Markov chain Monte Carlo surge heuristic with the Metropolis Hastings acceptance criterion. Um, so the prior is in the form of a Gibbs distribution. Um, so the prior information, again, the results from the CCA algorithm is encoded by an energy function. Um, so there's the prior in the form of the Gibbs distribution. The partition function can be approximated um, in this process, but I won't get into it. Um, the energy function measures how closely um, the prior information matches the current structure at each step of the MCMC algorithm. So um, that B matrix would be your prior information and then G would be your structure. Um, so that would be a matrix of one, of zero, one and zeros depending on whether or not you had an edge. Um, at each step of the MCMC algorithm, an edge is added or deleted. The Metropolis Hastings acceptance criterion is just a way to accept or reject that move. So um, that's just based on the likelihood and your prior and your Hastings ratio. So whether or not you're going to accept or reject that. And then Worley and Hussemeyer also provide a methodology um, to learn the, the hyperparameter along with the network structure so you don't have to guess what it is. Um, it'll tell you. So that's kind of nice as well. So you can learn the hyperparameter in, the, in your prior. Um, and this is easily extendable to multiple sources of information. Um, this prior is also very flexible to multiple data types. A lot of people have used this one for, for many different data types. So it's a nice one to use. OK, um, so now the results from that. So we used um, different data types as for the priors. So we used the results from the DNA methylation CCA as a prior, the results from the copy number CCA, the average between the copy number and the CCA, and the DNA methylation CCA as a prior. So that's one prior. Um, and then we had two independent priors using the DNA methylation CCA and the copy number CCA. Um, and so those were, yeah, those were two independent priors with two independent hyperparameters. Um, and then we needed time series data, so um, we downloaded that for MCF7 breast cancer cells from this source. Um, so this is a table of the area under the curve for the three networks. Um, and this is the area under the curve for them from the CCI and the area under the curve from the DBN algorithm. In um, most cases, we found that there was a little bit of an improvement when we used the time series data. So when we used the results from the CCA in combination with the time series data, we did find a little bit of an improvement. The only case where that wasn't true was with the GTA3 network, um, where we used DNA methylation and also the average. Um, and in those cases, um, I mean, time series data is kind of limited um, in comparison. So. Um, in, those, in those cases, actually, the CCA algorithm performed a bit better. Um, and I will also point out that using the average or using the two priors independently led to the best results for the DVN algorithm. OK, so some of the false positives may just represent unknown interactions that haven't been experimentally validated yet. So we took a look at some of those. Um, so these are false positives, the ones that we're, per we're particularly interested in are the ones that appeared um, no matter what type of prior we used um, in the DBN algorithm. Um, so these ones showed up in no matter which one we used. Um, EDN1 to Serpin F1 is an interesting one um, because EDN1 um, is a vasoconstrictor and Serpin F1 um, actually induces apoptosis by inhibiting stromal vasculature. So that one was interesting to us. Serpin F1 to PPARG um, scored very high in um, multiple prior types as well, but actually that one's experimentally validated, so um, that one's already out there. And we have some interactions from PCNA to CHECK2, DDB2, and the JAX um, that appeared multiple times. The IG1FR is kind of interesting. We also looked at the false positives that came out of the uh, copy number CCA. And IG1FR is known to have um, copy number aberrations in GBM, so it has a reduced copy number state in GBM. And there's um, other sources that say that there's something going on with uh, the copy number for IG1FR. And IG1FR came out 
as a regulator um, in our copy number CCA as well. Um, so we we th we think that um, the to the extent that a regulator is affected by copy number or DNA methylation would um, would make it actually useful to make these data types useful for inferring gene regulatory networks. So if you have a regulator that's strongly affected by copy number, then you'd be better able to identify these relationships. Um, so those are the ones that actually came out of the DBN. So I, IG1FR, it's that three and BRCA. Um, so our CCA-based algorithm could utilize DNA methylation or copy number to achieve high accuracy. Um, to infer gene, gene regulatory networks. Um, using DNA methylation um, to represent potential regulators outperforms copy number and gene expression in most cases. Um, the results of the CCA algorithm can be used as a prior in the dynamic Bayesian algorithm. Uh, using two priors uh, leads to the best results for the DBN algorithm. And so by closely examining um, false positive interactions, we presented some potentially novel interactions. I'd first and foremost would like to thank my advisor, Dr. Bozda, uh, and our lab members, Carl Stamm and Damian Reddy, and as well as Derek Husemeyer and Adrian Overly for writing wonderful methodology, um, as well as Marquette's High Computing Facility, the Kanchu Genome Atlas, and the FASA Mark Program for the Travel Award. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Let me start off, uh, for your uh, benchmark, do you provide the set of genes in each uh, subnetwork as an input, or are you analyzing the whole, all the possible? Okay, so yeah, you, you, so for this algorithm, we do have a set of genes. So there are a set of genes that you're going to ex be experimenting with, um, that you know about. And do you think it's, it's scalable to do something genome-wide? I think eventually, so, I mean, our algorithm is relatively quick. The CCA part of it's quick. The DBN algorithm most obviously has issues. Um, so potentially, yes. So thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question about the CCA part. So mm -hmm. uh, my understanding is that you try to find a set of uh, potential regulators and a set of potential targets that have the highest correlations. Mm -hmm. So I, I can imagine another approach is to have any regression method mm -hmm. to find one target at a time. So mm -hmm. what's the main difference between having multiple targets uh, in the CCA approach versus one target at a time? Okay, so we actually experimented with multiple targets and one regulator and multiple regulators and one targets. We found that in both cases that performed worse. Um, so potentially if you have multiple tar targets that you're looking at, then um, if that regulator um, is regulating those targets, then you'd have a bigger effect. Um, but then we also looked at multiple regulators and then one, a single target, and so that also performed worse. So we did look at that, um, but yeah, so that didn't perform as well. Um, the reasons why is a little bit elusive. I found it surprising and interesting that the methylation status of the regulators mm -hmm. seems to be more predictive than the expression of the regulators on the expression of the tar yes. targets. So can you, can you, what could be the possible mechanism? Do, 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 do you thought about this? Um, we have thought about it. So we did look at um, whether or not it established directionality. Um, so in the case of the DNA methylation, we looked at the score that was going in the correct direction and then the score that was in the incorrect direction. And so, and these are for genes that have just presumably one direction. So it's going from a regulator to target and not the other way around also. Um, and so we found that for DNA methylation, the score in the correct direction was actually higher than in the incorrect direction. So that may be part of it. Um, but I think that there might be other things going on as well. But I think it is in part due to um, DNA methylation's ability to kind of establish some sort of directionality in the network. This would mean that it is related to the data analysis itself rather than to some biological reason. No, no, it would be related. I mean, I guess it would be, it's kind of like perturbation experiments in a sense. So if, if, the, if you use expression data on both sides, it would be a little bit harder to tease apart um, which one was the regulator and which one was the target. You could still definitely say, okay, a relationship exists if you use expression data on both sides. Um, but then if you use something else for your regulators, then potentially you could 